<laughs> so, <laughs> oh, I, oh, yeah, you remind me. Yeah. The pharmaceutical <laughs> lobbyists rose up and uh, managed to quash uh, right. the penny a pill for sure. So. This is Democratic Visions. Here's Tim O'Brien. We are very pleased to welcome back Lori Pryor. Lori represents parts of Eden Prairie and uh, Minnetonka, which uh, is House Seat 48A. Is that correct? That is correct. So you've been through the grind before. You were in a, you campaigned uh, two years ago and you won. What brings you back to the process? Because it's an excruciating process, mm -hmm. isn't it, Lori? It is. I I I'm back at it. I guess because I know that there's still there's work that needs to get done. We had um, some good legislation that was proposed in these last two years, but we didn't get a chance to vote on it. And it's and it's legislation that people has broad public support. Now, can I interrupt sure. there? Because the reason that you didn't get a chance to vote on it is because the Republicans, as a matter of strategy, folded that into a 900 right. plus right. bill, yeah. 900 right. page and bill. It. And they came to the floor at 12:30 at night. So I can't say Saturday night. It was Sunday morning at 12:30 a.m. I'm trying to um, envision what a 900 page bill looks like. Is it about that thick? <laughs> That's about that thick. Did they yeah. actually print a copy for oh, everyone? Well, they didn't print copies for everybody, but any, anybody that wanted one could get a copy of it. Did you it. get a copy? I, I got one I shared with, with somebody else, though, because I figured, like, we, we don't need that stack of paper. And so this is, this is not what we elect people to do. Um, and the purpose of this... And we do, we can read them online, too, but did, it's like, that's part of it. Nobody had time to read it. Well, does, does any pretend, does anyone, and I mean anyone uh, who's seated in the legislature, pretend to have read it before it's voted upon? The only people that really had read it were the conference committee that created it. But, they, yeah. they, they read their sections of it, don't yeah, you Yeah, they think? read their sections of it, and then they kept putting it together and That's putting it together. That's War and Peace and put, times two. Yeah, yeah, yep, and so everybody's doing their own chapter. Mm -hmm. But you're right, I don't know if somebody... Well, some, I guess some of the nonpartisan staff must have read all of it together. Um, but it was introduced, um, you know, the, the, the session, we can't take any action after midnight on Sunday. And the bill came forward. Um, it was introduced on the floor at 1230 at night, um, less than 12 hours before we we're supposed to adjourn. And mm -hmm. we only had gotten access to it three hours before that. And mm -hmm. so, you know, even if I just speed reading it, you don't have Impossible. enough time to get through Impossible. it. So it was basically done without any input. It was just to take it or leave it. Who even knows what's in this bill? And so then when it was vetoed, that was not a shock. I want to st take a step back and take a little bit bigger picture look. Mm -hmm. Right now, the Republicans are in control of the legislature. Mm -hmm. The House is up for election. 11 seats turnover puts the Democrats in control of the legislature. That's vitally important because now, if the Democrats do that, they can bring up these particular bills for right. up or down vote. We don't, right. you know, if they pass, great. If they don't pass, at least people have had an opportunity to right. vote. to take a vote. And people will know where their representative stands if we can take a vote. I, I almost fell off my chair when I was reading that the uh, Speaker of the House, the Republican, was quoted as saying he's not going to put any gun measure mm -hmm. uh, before the body that has not been approved by the NRA. Now, that is almost incomprehensible to me. Was that something that came as a surprise to you, or were you aware of that? You know, it's, it's, it wasn't a surprise, really, because um, certainly when you're in that environment, you understand how much of it is election year politics. And, you know, there's sometimes a majority party forgets that they're also there to govern and that they're there to answer to the will of the people. And I think that was about just looking forward to the next campaign and not really thinking about what it is that people thought was important and what, um, what people want to see um, brought forward and voted on. I note that the, the focus of your campaign is on safe and healthy communities going mm -hmm. forward. But tell me more specifically what that means. Is, is gun violence something that fits right. into that category? It does, and very tell much me, so. tell me what the problem is and what you see as solutions. Right, so I can, I'll start with the gun violence. Yes, um, please. Uh, because there is some common sense legislation that we can pass. It's been passed in other states and it's made a difference. It saves lives. So one of them is closing the loopholes on background checks, um, the gun, sh gun show loophole, they say, because right now someone that um, is forbidden from getting a gun can go to a gun show, can go to a private seller and still purchase a gun. Out um, of a trunk. Yeah. 
Yeah, you know, in the in the parking lot. So you can just wow. so that person that sold the gun isn't breaking any laws by not checking background. They're a background it's not check. Required. Right. So the person buying it's breaking a law. The person that's selling it is not breaking a law. I and understand. Can just I understand. Ninety percent of Minnesotans want that uh, yeah. passed, yeah. and it, yet it never came for a vote. And it never came for a vote. Unbelievable. And there, the other piece of legislation that we talked about that other states have passed is the red flag law. They call it. And it's just when someone is an imminent threat to themselves or others that someone in that household or a proper authority can go to the courts and order the guns to be taken away. And we know that there are situations where um, there have been mass shootings and people knew ahead of time that that person was an imminent there, there's threat. No, there's no vehicle, present, present vehicle for that, huh? Yeah, there's just, it's, um, you know, there's some, there's some um, recourse for domestic abusers and the red flag, puts a due process in place and it can it can make a difference for some of those um, some of those very um, dangerous situations when there are guns in the home. Um, I know that there's a lot of really great common sense gun owners out there that are also supporting these measures. Well it's a issue that has to be addressed and it appears to me that it's an incumbent upon the Democrats to resume control of the legislature right. and pass those measures. Yep, yep. So Tell me about another issue that uh, is important to you in your uh, focus on safe and healthy communities. Right. Well, another issue, and again, the, um, we could have taken a vote on it. Um, I think we would have passed it, but it's to do something about distracted driving. Well, right now you can't text and drive, right? Right. You can't text and drive, but you can do the same thing, pick up a cell phone, look down at your cell phone, um, be touching your cell phone um, with one or two hands sometimes. People are doing it. And that's not against the law to make phone calls with your cell phone. And what this would say is that just like texting, you can't text during driving, you can't be holding a cell phone and making a call when you're driving. So what, it's, what it's called mean? hands free. So there, there's been a, a fair amount of publicity, uh, unfortunately, uh, realistic, but uh, negative about the type of care that our seniors and vulnerable mm -hmm. adults are getting in uh, health care facilities. So mm -hmm. Do you have any ideas along that line, along those lines as to how that could be addressed and improved? Right. So just like you said earlier about that big thousand, nearly thousand page bill, there were some provisions that would have addressed um, uh, protecting the issues that we need to protect our seniors in care facilities. Um, but I think we also needed to go beyond what was in that bill and just make sure that um, we do have the protection in place, that we do have the licensing in place, and the inspections in place where we can make sure that every facility where um, vulnerable adults and seniors are living, that they are really qualified to provide the care that they are. Are there facilities that are not licensed that are uh, operating at this present time? Well, there's this, this kind of this new field where you have assisted living. You know, it's not a nursing home, but these other yes. kind mm -hmm. of living arrangements that uh, seniors are, are moving into. It hasn't been around for as long, so it, it hasn't had the scrutiny that right now our, our nursing facilities would. Okay. And I want to now turn, uh, Laurie, if I could, to what I consider to be the fourth cornerstone mm -hmm. of your uh, plan to mm -hmm. uh, keep our communities healthy and safe. And that is the opioid epidemic. And right. I understand uh, from statistics, I guess these might be the latest statistics, that approaching 400 Minnesotans uh, died in 2016 from mm -hmm. uh, uh, opioid overdoses. Right, right. What can we do about that? Well, there's, um, the, the, you know, we start with the idea of, of preventing the addictions in the beginning. And we know that there's been this history of um, drug companies promoting their drugs and saying they're not habit forming, they're not addicting. Well, we can sue the heck out of yeah, them. Yeah, well, and that's, you know, I think that that's some, some states are working on that. Mm -hmm. um, but, what, but what we need to do is we need to bring these pharmaceutical companies, we need to bring them to the table and have bring them- in, Bring them to task. Bring them to task, because um, they, you know, it was their marketing and their promotion of these drugs that started the epidemic. And so they need to be part of the solution. And so whether it's the penny of the pill or increasing the licensing fees for selling um, mm -hmm. these opiate drugs in Minnesota, yeah. this is one way to get these pharmaceutical companies to be part of the solution. And with that, you know, with that, the increased fees or the penny of the pill, then we can work on uh, prevention, we can work on education, and we can work on treatment. And so doing that, we can, um, we can bring, in, bring an end to this epidemic. 
Well, well Governor Dayton was promoting the penny a pill uh, mm -hmm. approach, was he not? And tell me, what, what was the uh, gist of that legislation or proposed legislation? Right. So it would be just, you know, the, it's, the pharmaceutical it's a catching company would yep. have to right. pay a penny for every pill that they dispense into right. the system? Right, right. And so that, was, so that was the beginning of it. We had um, great bipartisan support when that bill was introduced. And, um, I mean, it's... It was two, um, two parents that had lost a child. Um, Don't to, tell me this got wrapped up in the 990-page yeah. mess. It, well, it, it didn't make it that far. Oh, <laughs> so. oh, I, oh yeah, you remind me. Yeah. The pharmaceutical <laughs> lobbyists rose up and uh, managed to quash uh, right. the penny a pill for sure. So we had the great bipartisan support. We had um, people that were serving in the legislature that have already lost children to this epidemic. And um, the Senate was actually able to pass a version of the bill, and they were the ones that introduced the idea of uh, um, having more of a licensing fee that pharmaceutical companies would be paying. So I'm thinking, okay, all right, that's, it's, it's something there too. But in the House, we didn't, we didn't, we didn't hear the legislation. It never, it never advanced to the, to the body to take a vote. Now, Lori, I know that Eden Prairie and uh, Minnetonka couldn't have a stronger proponent of education than you. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what would you like to see the legislature accomplish uh, in the education area in the upcoming session? Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of education just is basically making sure that there's a stable source of funding, and then you can give local control to your local school districts. Um, both um, Minnetonka and Eden Prairie. I mean, does that mean that yeah. the state can't borrow from the school districts again? That they did, no, as they did I, in the I, Plenty administration? Yes, I, that's exactly what I'm saying. I think that's we can start by doing no harm. We can we can keep our word, which is to support education in Minnesota. It's in our constitution, and that's what we have to do. We have to be there. This the reliable and adequate. Um, um, fully fund our schools. And I represent the Hopkins School District, the Minnetonka School District, and the Eden Prairie School District. They all have great school boards. They spend the money wisely. The, the state needs to do its share. So now uh, we, we get to the mother of all mothers, Southwest Light Rail. The powers that be have negotiated an agreement with the adjacent freight line and mm -hmm. where, there's, where the tracks run parallel for a certain period of time. That might get going yet this year. Is that a good thing for Eden Prairie? Oh, it's a great thing for Eden Prairie. Um, I know that the city of Eden Prairie, the people of Eden Prairie are excited for it and are still optimistic about um, how quickly, you know, that it's, how quickly we what can get started table? on it. I think it's about four years. Wow, and that's a long time, yeah, but, well, but it's, it's a major, it's a major, major, major project. It's major, yep. We've been told repeatedly by many different experts in the transportation field, we cannot build enough lanes to get out of gridlock. We have to be able to use multimodal. Same. We need the roads, but we also need other forms of transportation. We need mass transit. Well, you've done a heck of a job uh, in your capacity of representing 48A, but I know you are still out there going door to door to door. Yeah. What are you learning from the people that you're talking to? Um, there's some anxiety out there. Why is that? I think it's the anxiety over... It filters yeah, down from Washington? It, it's, yes, it's kind of the, the political climate right now. Uh -huh. And so I think that's one good thing I, why I'm glad that I'm out, because at least of all the people that are representing them, you know, here's somebody that they can talk to right. and talk to face to face. Right. Uh, I want to thank you for your upcoming election, but <laughs> we also got to get those 11 other seats in, in place. So mm -hmm. I'd like to see you uh, sitting in the majority come uh, mm -hmm. election day in November. Thanks for stopping by. Oh, thank you. Thanks, Tim. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Edina, Minnetonka, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.